Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Hauge. I'm the executive director of Homeline. And you have, you're joining us on Tuesday, May 18th at 1230 for uh, a webinar uh, that is in conjunction with Homeline and Mesh uh, to discuss um, planning, homelessness prevention planning at the end of the eviction moratorium. Um, we're glad you're joining us today. Uh, we're going to go through a few introductory slides here. We are then going to uh, have Homeline's managing attorney and tenant hotline director Mike Bra cover just a brief update about the status of the eviction suspensions. Um, our public policy director, uh, Michael Dahl, is going to share about updates. Uh, regular legislative session ended yesterday without uh, a ton of news, but there is a little bit of news that we'll be sharing. And uh, and then we have a great panel uh, to discuss this planning for the end of the moratorium uh, that we'll get to. So um, I want to just, I guess, really quickly before we get started, remind folks, this seminar really was designed uh, for an audience of folks that are uh, stakeholders in FHPAP, and um, it's really not necessarily meant for an audience of tenants or landlords. Um, we do have a seminar tomorrow, our regular Wednesday uh, COVID-19 legal uh, tenant landlord webinar that we've been doing since uh, mid-April. Um, we have one of those scheduled tomorrow. I'll put the link uh, in the chat so that if, if you maybe are joining this one by mistake, um, you'll get a lot more information specifically about uh, the, the eviction suspension, uh, other tenant landlord related issues uh, during the pandemic. If you join our, our seminar tomorrow, Wednesday, the 19th at 1.30, um, and we'll have a lot of time for Q&A during that seminar as well. So I'll put that link in the chat in just a moment. Um, and Mike, who's in charge of my slides, just stepped away. So uh, I'll just <laughs> uh, mention that um, what Homeline is. So uh, again, Homeline's been doing these webinars since uh, mid-April. Our main program is a free and confidential tenant hotline that provides uh, legal advice for renters throughout the state. We've advised uh, over 260,000 renters since, uh, since we opened. Um, we had served tenants in English, uh, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong, Hmong languages. And uh, we have a variety of staff members, uh, folks, attorneys and advocates that work on the hotline. Uh, we have a group of tenant organizers that uh, work in conjunction with groups of tenants that are uh, facing, experiencing uh, housing issues. Uh, we work on public policy and we do a lot of uh, tenant landlord education like, like today. And um, there's our phone number and um, the numbers for our uh, language specific hotlines. Um, and the next slide, Mike, is our upcoming webinar. So again, if you're joining us today and, and you're a tenant or a landlord, um, this, this webinar isn't necessarily for you. Um, it's designed for an audience of FHPAP stakeholders. Uh, but tomorrow we do have a, a regular webinar that will uh, be designed for, for uh, tenants, landlords, attorneys um, that are interested in specific legal questions around the pandemic. So. Um, the link is in the chat for that to register. And um, then the next seminar we're doing is uh, a few weeks out because legislative session did just end and there has not been an official uh, decision on an end of this, the eviction suspension or the off ramp is what people are calling it. Um, we are pushing out our next webinar until early June because there may be some decisions made uh, between now and then. So the next webinar that we're doing after tomorrow will be Wednesday, June 9th, again in the afternoon. And we probably uh, will have uh, some news from the legislature at that point about what the plan is. So uh, I'll put a, a link to that in the chat in just a moment too. Um, and then really the, the next slide before I hand it over to Mike is just a reminder uh, for folks. I think pretty much everybody on this call is more than well aware of the Rent Help MN and 211 uh, uh, rental assistance program that, that tenants can use to get caught up on rent uh, if they're eligible during the, the pandemic. So uh, more information is available on the website and by calling 211. With that, I'll, uh, 
I'll probably duck out here and turn my video and, and audio off and hand it over to Mike Farr, our managing attorney. Again, I'll put the link to uh, the next webinar after tomorrow on June 9th uh, in the chat. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we're uh, going to, yep. Nope, sorry, I heard a different voice. Um, yeah, we're going to do a quick update on the eviction moratoria. Uh, less than 10 minutes from the talk about where we're at status wise with both the federal and the state eviction moratorium. So we're all sort of on the same page today. To start, the state moratorium remains in effect. Uh, there was discussion this weekend, which Michael Dahl, our public policy coordinator, will be talking about in a few moments. Um, but there was no agreement reached over the weekend. The legislative session ended on Monday, and there's a possibility that that will happen later. But right now, the eviction moratorium that we have in place goes through June 14th in Minnesota. Uh, there are some exceptions to the eviction moratorium. A landlord can evict if the tenant is endangering the safety of others. Uh, on the premises, if they've caused significant property damage, if they are found with drugs or illegal weapons or prostitution in their place, or if the owner or their family member needs to move in. There's, that's, a, that's a really glib overview of the entire eviction moratorium plus the exceptions in Minnesota. But it's the same status we've had uh, virtually unchanged since August of last year. Uh, the eviction moratorium in Minnesota started in March of last year, but there were a couple tweaks. The August version is the last time it's been adjusted in any meaningful way. And so that is what we still have in place. It's been renewed officially 14 times. This is the 15th month of the eviction moratorium. Um, and that's the state moratorium that we have on evictions. The federal moratorium on evictions is quite a bit more complicated this is routed through the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Uh, it started in September of 2020. The current version, we're now in the fourth version of the CDC extensions. Uh, the current version expires June 30th of this year. There have been lots of court challenges around the United States uh, attacking the CDC order. Some have lost, landlords have lost their cases in federal district courts. Uh, however, there are a few landlords uh, that have prevailed in district courts around the country. The most important one by far is one that was issued uh, not long ago, the Alabama Association of Realtors. Uh, I believe it was actually within May. And it said, at least the original uh, order from the judge, that the CDC moratorium was not authorized by the original statute uh, from the 1940s that gave the CDC power over all kinds of interstate commerce with crops and, and uh, livestock, things like that. Uh, and it also most importantly said, this applies to the entire rule. Uh, all the other adverse decisions to the CDC moratorium said it only matters for the parties involved. We're only ruling on the parties in front of us, but the Alabama Association of Realtors heard in the uh, DC circuit, the 12th circuit uh, said, no, this is, we're, we're saying that the whole rule is, is bad and it, it can't be enforced anymore. That same night, the uh, federal district court judge issued a stay in her order uh, pending an appeal because the Department of Justice said, well, we're gonna appeal this. And then last week, the judge, uh, it, it was an immediate stay and a, an emergency stay and then last week, the judge issued a longer term stay in the CDC uh, moratorium striking down that she'd done earlier. The landlords have appealed the emergency stay. Uh, this is complicated stuff. And it's not really the world we work in. I, I'm a landlord tenant attorney, which means most of the work I do is state law specific. But from everything I've read, uh, a normal appeal would be uh, months uh, before we'd have anything meaningfully heard at the Court of Appeals, the next level up in the federal court system. Um, but it looks like they're trying to fast track this. It's difficult to know uh, the time frame that we're looking at. But the today answer is the CDC moratorium is in place. Now the CDC moratorium doesn't generally mean much in Minnesota because we have the state moratorium in place. But that's much less certain today than it was a month ago or two months ago. Um, there's meaningful conversations happening at the legislature to end that. And so 
uh, the CDC may be the backstop, the federal backstop, uh, and it stops all evictions for non-payment of rent is what it really does do. There's some affirmative steps the tenant has to take under the CDC, which we've never even really gone into because it doesn't matter in our state because we have more protections built in. CDC uh, moratorium uh, explicitly defers to those. So the short answer is things aren't really different than they've been for a long time, but there's a lot more in motion. And uh, all the eviction moratoria, if you're sort of getting the, the feeling or the sense of it, they feel like they're much less certain or concrete than they were um, months or even weeks ago. Uh, and so I, I think that things are going to happen and they're probably going to happen in the next few months, if not sooner. So that's the quick overview of what the moratoria are that are in place now. All right, let's turn this over to uh, Michael Dahl. Go ahead, Michael. Um, hello, my name is Michael Dahl. I'm the public policy director with Homeline. And uh, I'm going to give you a sort of the rundown on where things are at at the state legislature um, and can answer a couple of questions if people have them after I'm after I done presenting. Um, as some of you may have been paying attention to uh, things happening at the legislature, um, and it was already said the legislature adjourned on on Monday. And has resolved very little um, regarding um, what the next biennium, the ne what the next two years are to look like budget and policy wise. Um, and that begins on July 1st of this year. Um, so they adjourned um, and, and amongst all of the issues that, well, I, I should actually say what happened was the governor, um, the the legislature was about to adjourn, and the governor, the speaker of the house, and the majority leader um, of the Senate had gotten together, and they have thus far ironed out how much money is supposed to be appropriated to particular committees um, in the legislature. And so, we know that uh, ten million dollars in one-time funding has gone to the housing committee. Um, and $12 million in ongoing, and uh, again, uh, the tails, which is for a future years, um, have been appropriated to the housing committee. Um, but other than knowing that there's just this big block of money that, that ha they have to make decisions about, they actually have to get together as conference committees or working groups to try to resolve well, what is that money actually going to go for, and what should policy, what policies do we want to forward this legislative session? And all of those questions remain until the next special session uh, begins, which could happen on June 14th, when the governor um, has the power to extend the pay, uh, has the power to um, extend the peacetime emergency with, if there's no. Um, action by the legislature to remove that power. Um, but the next legislative uh, session, a special session could be on that date or sooner. But in addition to sort of deciding where money um, has to be placed, um, uh, as I said, they have all these policies that they have to deal with. And um, financial issues have to be resolved by May 28th, according to the agreement that the governor, the speaker of the house and the majority leader in the Senate uh, came up with. So um, how much money, how, how money gets divvied up on the housing committee, for example, is supposed to be decided by the 28th. By the 4th of June is when policy issues are supposed to be dealt with. Um, and so that deals with the specific topic we're talking about today, which is the off ramp. Um, the off-ramp for Minnesota um, has, it's different in both the House and Senate. Um, and uh, there's a huge gulf between them. Um, both sides um, would do, um, would allow for an eviction based on a material breach of lease with exceptions for some, uh, some evictions. Um, and how they handle that um, uh, is different in both the House and the Senate. There are also differing timelines on when various things can various things can occur. Um, for instance, when can you evict for um, individuals at uh, um, that uh, um, at at certain income levels uh, um, gets dealt with in the Senate. Um, there's also difference on guidance on uh, notice for eviction um, when re when rental assistance is pending or available. Um, and so um, there's just a and every day those 
those confines, those those the differences change every day because there's negotiations that are happening between um, the House and the Senate about what it is they're they're in favor of as far as far as compromise. All I can what all I'll say about more about the differences is that the Senate, the Minnesota Senate, um, which is uh, controlled by the Republicans, um, has really moved very little from its position in the past over the past month or so. Um, the House has moved just a little bit on some issues trying to show that there's up for compromise. Um, but again, the, the differences are just very vast. And I, I could answer some questions about particular differences. But again, I'd rather not get into the details. Because um, it uh, the 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 details are changing so frequently. And if I can go to the next slide, what, I, what I'd prefer to actually talk about is what is it that we'd want um, out of a, an agreement that can happen to um, uh, between the House and the Senate and the governor. And I'm gonna put in the chat the ways to contact um, these folks. Um, and you'll find that there. Um, here's what we'd like. We think that tenants and landlords need to be, uh, both sides need to be made whole. And there's an, a lot of money coming from the federal government that would allow that to happen. Um, so as the Minnesota legislature again negotiates the end of the eviction moratorium, we want to send a message to, the, to them that there are things that, that just need to be in the end agreement. And the first thing is that needless evictions for non-payment of rent cannot be allowed uh, to proceed when tenants and landlords are eligible for rental assistance. In the Senate bill, um, it says that landlords can apply. In the House bill, it has more power going to tenants. But either side, we think that the tenants and landlords should be working together to apply for rental assistance that is now available through um, uh, renthelpminnesota.org. Um, and as long as a pending application or an attempt is being made to put in an application, um, we don't think that someone should be evicted from their apartment. Um, if there is an eviction filed, there should be a 60 day written notice prior to the eviction um, so that someone who, so a renter has its time to try to get the resources for the, um, um, through uh, the state. Also, if, they're, if their case is pending, um, that they should be able to maintain their housing then as well. But if there's another reason that there's an eviction that's being filed, there will be a 60 day written notice prior to filing an action so that the tenant has a chance to either remedy the situation or perhaps decide to move from the unit um, because they can't keep up with their terms of the, the agreement. And if a tenant is left, you can't evict them. There can't be a court case asking them to leave because they've already done that. Um, and as you all know, evictions are incredibly difficult um, to get over when you're trying to find a place to rent. And then lastly, we say that improperly filed evictions which occurred during the moratorium period should automatically be expunged. Um, and there's a limited number of rules that um, uh, there's a limited number of reasons why someone can be could can be evicted during this time frame, but basically um, uh, 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 we want those uh, improperly filed ones to be um, to be um, uh, uh, thrown out because they're illegal. Um, and so once again, I've said we're trying to get these messages developed, uh, delivered to the Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka and Speaker of the House Melissa Hortman. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Mike Mannard, who is going to facilitate the next portion of our talk, is that how easy do you want your job to be? Um, do we want more homelessness or less homelessness? Do we want more people double up or less people double up? And if you care about that, I'd ask that you take action, perhaps even during this webinar, by sending a short message with these three points saying that you want an agreement to um, include this, these actions. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike. And if there's any questions to me that Mike, you can decide if they can be asked, but um, we have the chat box if anybody does have some questions. And I'll leave it to you, Mike. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, want to note, uh, please do use the chat as we're going through um, uh, in, in planning this, this workshop. Uh, we're really trying to build off of what um, has happened within the FHPAP uh, program overall. There's been a, a huge collaborative uh, approach uh, to, to um, 
how we uh, look to prevent uh, and end homelessness across the state. And so um, uh, ask questions and, and get discussion going as, as you're able. Um, if possible, try and clarify who you're targeting the question to. Um, and uh, we, we made it tricky for you because you've got three mics on. Uh, uh, <laughs> if, the, if, the, if, if the Mike who likes to be called Michael can say just one more thing. Yeah. And that's that, um, as Mike Vra pointed out, we've had 14 times where the eviction um, uh, moratorium has gone forward. And as he said, it seems like we're getting closer and closer to the period where we're not going to have that be in place. In fact, some people might uh, are predicting that it could happen as, as early as um, June 30th, that the um, eviction moratorium could be um, ended. And then depending on what they don't do with the legislature to sort of extend that period for certain folks um, uh, is yet to be negotiated. Great. Um, so what we want to do with our, our time remaining is, is really to hear from each other and to ask questions and to um, learn of strategies that, that folks are implementing um, to prepare for this. Um, we, as, as Michael was saying, uh, it is coming. The end of the moratorium is coming. Um, so what are we going to do about it? And how do we uh, take steps to minimize uh, what looks like in a, a significant crisis that is, is going to be on our hands? Um, so to, um, in addition to the information of kind of where we're at, uh, we wanted to have time to be able to hear from regions, um, uh, and, and the volunteering, volunteered regions here are not, uh, I think, claiming to have all the answers. I know there's a lot of questions and, and, um, uh, of what, of what to do, but, but we have, uh, four regions, uh, indiv uh folks who, who volunteered to be able to, share what's happening in their community um, to get uh, information out there that might be new uh, for your regions and kind of grow uh, good ideas, uh, but also just to get uh, thoughts going. Um, and and uh, from there, we wanna have some discussion and, and uh, uh, questions and, and such to be able to uh, uh, address what's, what's needed in your community most. Um, so uh, we have Emma Schmidt uh, from Lakes and Prairies uh, CAP, um, Angela Larson uh, from UCAP, uh, Peter Goldstein from uh, Scott uh, County and the Scott Carver FHPAP, and uh, Rebecca Bowers and Terry uh, Lazaretti, uh, hopefully I got that right, uh, from Dakota County. Um, and then in addition to that, I just want to note that Diane Elias from Minnesota Housing and Isaac Wengard from um, uh, DHS are both on as well. Um, they won't be uh, really presenting, uh, but but some of the questions that I've heard uh, folks talk about are like, how do we braid funds uh, so that we we can kind of meet needs and such? And and so having Diane and Isaac available, um, uh, they're they're available to ask uh, answer questions or jump in um, with with places where they think uh, they might be able to contribute. So. Um, with that uh, being understood, uh, there are some questions that we asked out of the uh, four regions. Uh, and if we want to go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll just uh, kind of cover all together uh, the questions we asked because um, as folks kind of uh, jump in and, and talk about things, um, uh, I, I want you all to have kind of permission to um, go beyond what is on the screen. Um, but uh, the main uh, questions uh, overarching are, you know, what's happening in your community uh, that, that you feel is innovative and that you think other regions would benefit from hearing uh, about? Um, uh, other questions are, what have you been uh, doing to identify the scale of need in your community? Um, that's a question a lot of us have of when the moratorium ends, how, how broad is that um, going to be? Um, uh, and then another question is, uh, what are the strategies you're identifying to prepare for that end? So what are you doing right now? Um, how are you trying to uh, identify that need and reach people? Um, and then in addition to that, what are the strategies you're identifying 
for once the moratorium ends, what's going to happen at that at that point? Um, a lot of you just applied uh, for FHPAP, um, or you're looking at how to use EA or other resources. Um, how are you uh, trying to kind of get uh, things in place for that that time? Um, in addition to that, how are you ensuring that your response uh, to the moratorium is going to be equitable? Um, how do we make sure uh, that we use our this this response and this time and the resources that are out there to actually um, decrease the disparities that we know uh, are perennial in our housing and, and homeless response system. Um, uh, because I think there's a huge risk that it could exacerbate uh, uh, that. And uh, just any other things in the community that folks want to share. So those are all the things that we've asked folks. Um, and I, I, I think just in the emails and such before, I, I, I don't think every region is going to be able to respond to every question uh, uh, robustly, but we will, we will walk through. But again, as, as we do, I want to just invite our, our panel uh, uh, to jump to what is most relevant and, and needed uh, in your community that you want to share. Um, and uh, I, I don't have to go in order. So if there's somebody uh, on the panel that is dying to go first, uh, we could do that. Um, but otherwise, I think we'd go back yeah, up to that initial question of what's happening in your community um, that you can share uh, and would start with um, Emma. Hi there, I'm Emma Schmidt. I am with Lakes and Prairies Community Action Partnership. Um, our CAP LP is our nickname, which is a little bit less of a mouthful. Um, and we serve Clay and Wilkin counties um, on the western edge of the state. And it's a little bit of a unique uh, uh, position geographically because our largest city is Moorhead, which um, borders North Dakota um, and Fargo. Um, and the, the city really is quite connected um, and the people that are experiencing homelessness go back and forth based on, you know, for example, our domestic violence shelters in Fargo. Um, there's not one in Moorhead. So there is kind of a lot of back and forth between clients. Um, so for us, I think something that's been super important is just strong community planning and coordinating of resources because as everybody on here is aware, there's been just a lot going on with different resources available, um, really working hard within the West Central COC to prioritize incoming resources and try um, try to be as agile as we can to look at the data that we have coming in our coordinated entry um, system to try to identify gaps and needs and services. Um, so that is, that's been very important. Um, another, um, Another item we've been working really hard on is coordinating with our local um, 211 for prevention and diversion. Um, so we have been working on coordinating our homeless prevention resources for many years now. I think 2017 um, is when we really started saying like, well, why can't we all just have the same application, you know, between us and Salvation Army and, you know, the, the other prevention resources we have in our community. So we started with a universal application, I think we called it, where we just kind of pulled together, okay, what are the things everybody needs? And now we're to the point where we have some funding from our local United Way to help us um, have um, some uh, prevention and diversion resources on the front end, um, more than we've been able to have in the past. So that's that um, project is supporting us to um, work with our two-in-one to be the the call center um, to take, you know, 24 seven to be able to screen pre-screen calls and then um, help us to, um, uh, you know, prioritize um, homeless prevention households. Um, and then eventually um, they will be helping um, to, to do um, some pretty substantial diversion um, uh, services, which is really exciting. Um, and at Cap LP, we've really been working hard to just get the funds out the door as quickly as we can. And we tried to um, kind of beef up the homeless or the whole family approach. So we've seen a lot of people that have um, reached out to us that we, I mean, a lot of people that we have known for quite some time, but also people that have never 
um, had to access services before. So people that don't know, like, you know, what's, what's food support or how do I apply for SNAP? And just these things that we think everybody knows how to do that. So um, trying to wrap all the services that, you know, a lot of community actions have just a, a really large variety of services. We've been trying to um, beef up our approach with a whole family tool um, that kind of is a, a, a way to trigger what, um, with the simplest amount of information as we can, to try to trigger what programs people might be eligible for. Um, and then lastly, I was just going to add that our legal services, Northwest Legal Services of Minnesota, has been um, a really, uh, had a, a lot of um, leadership in working with our court system. So they've been really working closely with the courts to um, liberally grant continuances for people that um, have evictions or will have evictions. So they've got Zoom rooms um, set up in court hearings where they can take applications and give legal advice. Um, and then they've also set up a bunch of different kiosks um, in the service area that can be used for like scanning, using the computer, um, things like that. Um, and their um, goal is to meet with as many people as they can before the moratorium is lifted. So they're prioritizing any um, eviction or housing cases um, because they really want to, um, you know, prevent as much as possible um, once the eviction uh, moratorium is lifted. So they're um, kind of changing the way they're prioritizing their cases. Awesome. Well, thank you, Emma. And, and I think we'll, um, again, please uh, put questions uh, for any of the panelists in the chat as we go along. I think we'll let everybody kind of uh, have some uh, initial uh, overview at the beginning and then we'll, we'll go to some questions afterwards. But, um, how about next uh, we hear from uh, Peter uh, with Scott County and Scott Carver, FHBAP. Mike, thanks for the invitation to join this meeting today. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Peter Goldstein. I work with Scott County in our housing department. And I think it's important to set the stage for those who uh, might be under familiar with our FHPAP program. So Scott and Carver counties. Um, uh, while we're both in the seven county metro region, uh, we are the two non entitlement counties that sit within uh, the seven county metro. And we really try to take a collaborative approach uh, in our FHPAP work, as well as some of our other services that are really geared towards supporting people experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, we do and have delivered FHPAP jointly for quite some time, with Carver County serving as kind of the primary grantee for this. Um, and I will do my darndest to reflect Carver County's work throughout this presentation as well. In my preparation for this panel, I'll be uh, mindful to identify that I took the second question identified here um, to be my kind of area of focus, as a lot of the strategies that we have implemented would be similar to what Emma outlined and what I would imagine you know, many other regions are taking. So I really wanted to focus on some areas that I think are unique to the Scott Carver region with the hopes of um, uh, providing some insight that I think other regions could potentially implement as well. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to highlight collaboration with our public housing authorities. So both Scott and Carver County are very fortunate to have a PHA that serves our respective county, um, with Scott County's PHA serving as our voucher administrator as well. Uh, at the request of the Fair Housing Implementation Council, uh, the PHAs really spearheaded a lot of our local efforts towards um, meeting to prepare for the end of the eviction moratorium. Uh, we really started our efforts, I mean, we started them obviously as soon as, it, as the eviction moratorium was put into place, but really intentionally at the beginning of this year, started to meet on a, a semi-monthly basis to begin discussing different 
things that we could do to uh, really bolster the level of support offered within the community. Um, through that meeting, we identified that it wouldn't be something that any one of us could take on ourselves. And so we wanted to ensure that we could have the insight of um, our law librarians. We also are really fortunate to be in the service area of a uh, SMURLS program. So the Southern Minnesota Regional Legal Services program that was funded by the Polad Foundation uh, that really sought to provide expedited access to legal assistance to households that are identified um, as in need by financial eligibility specialists, school social workers, and or FHPAP staff. So knowing that we sat within a region that um, could really attract support from SMURLs, we wanted to see uh, what they would be able to offer within the space as well. And so our meetings quickly uh, kind of expanded to include staff from both counties, staff from our PHAs, our law libraries, as well as SMURLs advocates. Um, through that meeting, we kind of focused on some of the asks that were identified previously. Um, we know that the availability of information about Rent Help MN, as well as what will be needed, is central towards ensuring that folks are able to stay stable in their housing in our region. And um, first and foremost, we wanted to tackle updating our court summons documents. So when we really sat down and started to look at those, we realized how antiquated they were, both in terms of the resources that were listed on them, as well as some, as, uh, some of the recommendations for court preparation. Uh, so we sat down and started to work on those and to make sure that the inclusion of resources were right there on the summons documents regardless of the direction that our legislature takes. Again, we just wanted to ensure that um, for folks that were susceptible to being evicted, that they would for sure have access to that information right from the, um, uh, right from the beginning of, of knowing that they were susceptible to, to being evicted. The next area of focus that I'm hopeful to bring into this panel um, is an acknowledgement of uh, what involvement with the PHAs can bring. Um, so in Scott County specifically, most of the cities across our county uh, have some sort of rental registration requirement for all of the properties within their jurisdiction. Um, and while I will be the first to tell you that that leads to some unintentional things um, that I don't want to dive too deep into. Uh, it also provided an avenue for clear and consistent um, communication to be established. Um, so knowing that we had a list of all of the identified rentals across the county, uh, as well as contact information for the owners or administrators of all of those rental properties, um, we began to disseminate information widely through those channels. So it really started with an acknowledgement of the eviction moratorium, an acknowledgement of the resources that were in place initially when that moratorium was put into place. It expanded to include uh, CARES Act specific programming that was set up both on a statewide uh, level as well as locally. Um, and through that, we were able to offer a pathway for landlords to apply directly for assistance for um, uh, properties that they had within the county. And that really opened up the door for us to try to do some uh, promotion of uh, working with voucher programming as well. So it um, started as a way to disseminate information and then was found to be a really strong recruitment strategy that we could uh, utilize on the back end. Prior to the pandemic uh, and a couple of years ago, our communities received some support from MESH uh, to really increase uh, the impact that our meeting structures could have and through that technical assistance we received, 
we started to do a weekly operations call. Now, by no means do I want to suggest that we're able to get everything solved within these weekly operations calls, but especially during the pandemic, it's provided us with a, um, a tool to be able to uh, gather frontline staff and other FHPAP stakeholders, as well as folks from across our homeless response system to talk about different things that they're seeing on a, on a regular basis, as well as to make sure that we have a, a channel to pass along um, any updates and any resource information that might be new. Um, quite frankly, it, it has really allowed for us to remain connected throughout this last year in a way that um, I don't know would have otherwise been possible. And then lastly, to give another plug to our um, law librarians in both Scott and Carver counties, neither of our communities has a designated um, housing court established. And so I think it's really important to be able to offer um, at the very least an opportunity for folks to have access to a legal clinic. And throughout the pandemic, um, both of our communities have been able to stand up virtual law clinics that have continued um, on a monthly basis. And uh, it's, it's really been helpful to be able to promote the availability of those clinics and really um, offer a place for households that are presenting at any point within our system to be able to get connected there um, to have assistance. Awesome, thank you, Peter. I appreciate can I ask it. A quick, can I ask a quick question, uh, Mike? Yep. I know that we want this from the general public, which we <laughs> we want people to fill in questions in the chat box, definitely. Yep. But I wanted to ask Peter, um, I think it's great what you did regarding finding rental licenses and then doing outreach to landlords. And I'm wondering if that receptivity, if they were by and large sort of more very receptive to your outreach and, um, and then uh, how easy it's been to sort of bring them into the fold into um, working with their tenants in, in figuring out how much um, needs to be applied for. Certainly, a uh, really good question, Michael. And I will be the first to identify that fortunately I have not been the one um, immediately tasked with doing much of that outreach. So much of what I'm gonna regurgitate back to you will be uh, kind of pass through information. Uh, first, I understand that folks have been very receptive to the outreach. And I think the reason for that re receptive Activity is uh, resulting from the idea or the strategy that we're trying to make folks whole. So in initiating that outreach by saying, hey, here are the mechanisms that you're able to pursue. Here is the information that you would need or that your tenants would need in order to be successful to uh, access this rental assistance. Um, I think has been a good bridge towards um, being able to build up the kind of recruitment strategies that we would like to see um, offered across the whole state. As far as uh, recruitment into HCV, uh, I do recognize that in Scott County directly, you know, we're looking at a, a very small rate of vacancy across the county. And so, especially for uh, units that are gonna fall within our respective payment standard. I think that you know we're looking most frequently at a rate that probably mirrors, mirrors excuse me, 0%. Um, so utilizing that as an acknowledgement, I think that the recruitment strategies might not yet bear a ton of open units, but hopefully in the future, if there is movement out of the units, these landlords will be more amenable to partnering with the CDA to uh, work with rental assistance programs. All right, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Peter. Um, and why don't we uh, next uh, hear from Angela Larson at UCAP? Hi there, I almost said good morning, but it's afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thanks uh, for inviting me to share about what's happening in Southwest. I work for United Community Action Partnership or UCAP, and we serve with emergency housing services, 13 counties in Southwest 
Northwest Minnesota. So um, that's most of our COC region. Um, innovative things or things that we've been seeing around the community. Um, we have, you know, I think we started really working and planning on um, getting ready for the end of the eviction moratorium when CHAP even launched. And so um, during that time, we worked feverishly and quickly ramped up um, to try to get as many people's housing uh, issues resolved as possible during that time. I think we had over 2,300 applications that we process through CHAP and um, we were able to bring on uh, a number of staff to help with that program. And when that program ended, we started immediately working on the next, um, you know, uh, um, resources that were going to be available. And one of the things that we were able to do with CHAP that kind of has trickled over and, and we're thankful to be able to continue to offer is that you know even even before the pandemic we had started trying to um, really prioritize hiring um, multilingual staff, diverse staff that were reaching our populations that we're seeing in our communities. Because even though we're a very rural area, we do have communities who have become increasingly diverse over the last few decades. So currently we have um, half staff who speak Spanish, Hmong, Somali, Karen, Arabic, Swahili, and Barava. And that has been such a huge asset to us um, to be able to retain some of those, or all, actually all of those staff right now because they're working on the Rent Help MN and then some of our other programs, programming through FHPAP. Um, so that has really assisted us in reaching out to different populations. They have helped us um, work, on, work on some marketing. I think we're gonna get to that question after a little bit too. Um, and another partnership that we've been working on to try to increase access to people and get ready for the eviction moratorium is through our Lower Sioux Indian community. And so that's a group that we have been working with for probably over a year now um, to try to increase access of their community members. And uh, one of the things that's recently um, been solidified and planned is that we are going to be trying to bring on a uh, a UCAP staff person to actually be on site at the Lower Sioux in their new hub for services that they are building. Um, you know, we had offered to them to help be like a sub grantee of one of our um, one of our other grants, um, and they didn't feel like they were at a place where they could take that on. Um, but they thought having one of our staff on um, on site for them, their community, would be a really great next step. So that's what we're we're looking at right now. Um, and then the other thing that we've been doing um, is to just like reach out, to, you know, in rural Minnesota, especially, I feel like we, you really get to know all of your partners really well. And I think that we all work really well together. So I think that's been helpful, but just having intentional conversations about what the eviction moratorium ending is gonna mean and what it's gonna look like has really helped us with our planning. We've been able to bring on new partners for our FHP program with our um, DV providers, going to be doing some in, uh, more intensive services for victims. Um, we've been working with our housing trust fund provider to try to increase services to people with those vouchers because uh, they've been having some trouble getting some of those filled. Um, and just kind of looking at all the resources that are out there because it's going to take all of the resources that are out there to try to handle what's coming. And so we're just trying to be really planful about that. And I think that uh, um, that's what makes it innovative. Awesome. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then if we can... Uh, turn to uh, Terry and Rebecca, uh, both from Dakota County. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, we're going to tag team. At, we've got a lot going on in Dakota, so we thought you needed to hear from both of us to be able to get it in. Um, so I think, um, you know, as Angela mentioned, one of the things that we've had to our benefit is that we've done a lot of planning because of CHAP. Um, so we also had direct assistance um, through local CARES dollars. So I feel like we've been planning around a lot of money and waiting you know, for this eviction wave to come. So I feel like we've been um, 
planning for over a year on this wave and um, it, you, you'd think we'd have like a super solid plan, but things continue to change based on new resources. And um, I wanted to just talk a, a, a bit about our planning process and how we've been uh, braiding the funding together. And then Terry can talk about the more specific court strategies that we've been using that have, um, I think, really started to prepare us well for what's coming. Um, we've had um, a lot of uh, direct assistance. So as a direct allocation, um, we're get, we have $12 million in ERA funding. So it's a, it's a lot of money and it sounds like it should be enough, but there's very little for staffing for that. So a lot of our planning has been around how do we deliver this money and get it to the people who are most at um, risk of homelessness and most vulnerable. So um, recently, I think we've done a really great job in um, planning with the community to identify where those gaps are. Um, particularly concerned about um, those who aren't able to get through the barriers um, that an online system has. So planning around um, people that don't have technology access, they might have, um, you know, limited literacy, they might, you know, language skills, um, English not being their first language. So planning around that and how we're going to fill those needs, because there's going to be a group of people who are able to just go on a, online and apply and get access to the resources. But we're most concerned about those that are um, more vulnerable and trying to develop some strategies that are um, on site that um, Terry can talk about with the eviction court and with the funding to try to piece together um, what we need for staffing, outreach services. So we've had a group of staff in our FHPAP work group has been super helpful in this and partners that have been planning around how do we put all these funding pieces together and pay for positions that we need. So um, we've done a few things with repurposing funding. So we had some direct assistance dollars left over from a POLAD grant um, because of all this um, state funding that's available. So we've repurposed some of that to contract with a couple of local organizations that primarily serve households of color and immigrant families. So that's been a um, I, I feel like an innovative strategy that we've been able to do um, hand in hand with the community so that we can reach parties that aren't going to be able to just go online and just apply themselves. So we've done a lot of work in, in that space and developing these um, more targeted service solutions for people that are going to have barriers, even, you know, mental health being overwhelmed with trying to get online and apply for um, these complicated systems. So just working together with a team to, to come up with that. So when we get to the equity question, we can we can talk more specifically about what some of those strategies are. Um, but I can um, turn it over to Terry to talk about um, the eviction court strategies. Yeah, hi. Um, so about, I would say maybe a year before um, COVID was even a thing, we have been planning with the courts some pre-planning on um, a Dakota County housing clinic. And what that would be is a uh, combination of on-site services, similar to what it happens in um, St. Paul currently, and I think Anoka County is running a program too, where at first appearance, um, people could, tenants can decide if they would like to meet with someone from legal aid. And there's, uh, in Dakota County, there'll be two legal aid, um, agencies that will be there. It'll be legal assistance of Dakota County and Smurls, and um, they can decide if they want to meet with 360 communities who will have funding options for them. And then um, they can also decide that they want to uh, maintain that connection with 360 communities for a period of 30 days or longer for some case management and follow up, because oftentimes we know that if someone's behind on their rent, they have other needs as well. So we're working on those needs so it's not like a revolving door with eviction court. Um, through our housing program, that's what we see a lot of the same family cycling through the, the system and stuff. So we really wanted to get uh, a hold of that too. Um, I think the, the biggest thing to start in this program was the connection that we formed with the court so that we have that now so that when we're planning for this eviction moratorium, we're all on the same page. It's very easy to schedule with them. We've talked about what we can do um, 
and again, following in Ramsey County's uh, shoes, they have I um, they have their own. Uh, see, this is where the court kind of attorneys things. Uh, I, I I don't speak court very well, but what they do do is um, if if someone comes to first appearance, a tenant comes to first appearance, and if the parties request the clinic services, uh, including legal advice or representation, emergency assistance, or whatever that is, the court then will recess to allow the uh, provision of such services as possible. And um, that the, the case is given a seven day continu continuance. And so Dakota County is looking into that in our connection. The judge is really happy to look into anything that we can provide for that. We're hoping that um, some of these strategies that we form will actually be a permanent addition to our courts because we know that um, we, there's just not enough time with um, the, the time that it takes for a, a client to, or a tenant to get through an uh, emergency assistance application, it can pend for like 30 days. There's just not enough time. So we're looking at strategies like putting marketing on the court website, um, ERA preference for those that have filings so that they will be fast tracked. A real up uh, boost paid for by the new funds, uh, the ERA two funds, where there's there's more funding for that to support the program in the way that we had a, a very scaled back version. This is going to be much different, so we're going to put more staffing effort into that and to really support that program. And then what, one of the a couple of things that that I've done like personally is kind of dig into. Um, you know, HUD and your and your PHA's local guidance too, as far as like one of the things that I saw in there is the um, ESG COVID waivers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it was put out on four, on April 14th, if you're not aware of it, on pages three and four, if you really look at that language and I actually re reached out to the um, to HUD regarding it because it's so unclear. Anything that they write is pretty unclear, but in essence, it allows our rapid rehousing folks to actually extend for a period of time. And that time is not um, labeled in there, but it, it appears to be up to another 24 months. So what we're trying to do here in Dakota County is really get upstream and work on prevention efforts versus you know, how we've always been set up as a response system, so many of us are, and to really be able to, um, to look at those, those things to keep our families housed so we don't have to see them in eviction court and we, they don't have to get caught up in this. Another is look into your local PHA's um, preferences because with ours, there's an emergency preference for those that are, um, let's say they're displaced from a fire. If they're on the HCV wait list, they uh, can automatically move to the top of that wait list. So in looking at that guidance, I was able to reach out to our PHA, the CDA in Dakota County and ask them, well, uh, at the time, this is considered an emergency. And it still is an emergency. We have emergency orders out there. So can we use that for um, HCV preference? And it turns out that we could. So we've gotten to take some people that were right on the border of not being able to afford housing, and they were already on the HCV wait list, or they're homeless, and they're homeless due to COVID, and get those, those uh, households connected with HCV. So those are a couple of the things that we're doing. And we're also looking at the emergency HCV vouchers to see how we can tie those in with uh, homelessness or um, people that are not stably housed and, and in need of those supports. So that's just a couple of things that we're doing on the prevention side. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if, and I, there's no chat yet, um, and we're Minnesotans, so we kind of take our time with, with that thing. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, having heard kind of a general overview of, of what folks are doing, um, 
Are there any uh, follow-up questions that folks have uh, for that? Are there other areas that you're thinking about in your region that didn't come up, uh, kind of uh, solutions or ideas um, that either you want to contribute or you want to ask about? Um, so please uh, throw it in the chat uh, as, you, uh, as, as things come up. But why don't we just uh, move to the next question in the meantime? And we'll do this more as, as popcorn. And, and I, again, in fairness to you all, I asked you a very broad question at the beginning, so you may have already covered this. Um, so we'll just spend a little bit of time on each uh, as folks have um, um, uh, more that you, you feel like you can contribute in the area. So are there other things that didn't come up um, that any of you feel you've been doing uh, to identify scale of need in your, in your community? I can certainly kick this one off. Sure. Um, again, going to that partnership that was established, we have uh, fortunately been able to connect with our court admin staff several times throughout our planning efforts, whether that was planning for CHAP, planning for SARA, or planning for this upcoming FHPAP biennium to just get a general feel for where we're at uh, with the number of filings that have occurred uh, dating back to March of 2020, as well as some historical filing data to try to kind of better assess what a typical year looks like within Scott County. Um, we, between Scott and Carver County, uh, throughout this current FHPAP biennium, are working with um, uh, one subgrantee, the CAP Agency of Dakota, Scott, and Carver Counties. And uh, the CAP agency has a capacity within their current system to be able to track the calls that are received by their agency. So we have a better sense on the number of turnaways that are happening at F uh, for requests related to FHPAP and have been able to uh, kind of maintain those statistics on a quarterly basis throughout this current biennium. Uh, very similarly, we are uh, seeking to work in conjunction with our financial eligibility staff to uh, better ensure that we are collecting turnaway data for emergency assistance and emergency general assistance requests. Um, and then lastly, uh, again, acknowledging the localized programs that were stood up following the availability of CARES Act funding um, in Scott County, our local program, which was available to landlords to apply for directly, um, was capped out within a day and a half um, of being opened. Uh, fortunately, though, in Carver County, their uh, landlord assistance program is still operating, and so we're able through those efforts to have a pretty good pulse on the types of requests that are continuing to come in in the community. Awesome, thank you. Any others here about what you're doing uh, that is helping you identify the scale of need coming up? I can hop in here real quick too, just to, to add to what Peter was saying that, you know, data I think is just super important as much as we can possibly get our hands on at this point. So we've been trying to connect with landlords um, and utility companies to try to see um, what kind of data they have that they're willing to share with us. So Moorhead Public Service is probably our biggest utility company besides Excel. Um, so they had told us that in April of 2019, they had um, 60 disconnections. They didn't have any disconnections last year because of COVID. And in April of 2021, they had 321 disconnects. And they said that they're likely gonna have 60 more in the, within the next two cycles. Um, so they had shared, they've been sharing with us what they're seeing. They have um, $1.75 million in back payments that they have not received from people. So, you know, just, just learning that really kind of puts it into perspective with, how many people, you know, what we're going to be seeing probably when the eviction moratorium lifts too. Um, and so, you know, same with housing authorities, you know, kind of like Peter was saying, it's really helpful to get a gauge for how many folks they think are behind. One of our housing authorities said that they thought it was probably about a quarter of the residents were behind on their rent. Um, and then lastly, too, just like you said, tracking, trying to internally track 
um, calls and applications for assistance because it's really been like way up and down for us that we've seen, you know, like right when the pandemic started, calls were shooting through the roof, you know, phone was ringing off the hook. It, you know, decreased. Um, and this is obviously extremely general. When CHAP, uh, when CHAP started, you know, we were able to really um, funnel a lot of people towards that resource. And when CHAP ended, um, we saw a lot of need. Um, and our, we have an FHPAP program, which is fantastic. Um, but unfortunately, we have to turn down the vast majority of people that apply just because there's not enough assistance for the need we have. Um, so now with Rent Help MN, we've been again trying to funnel folks to as many mainstream resources as possible um, before, um, you know, considering them for other programs that are, you know, strictly homeless prevention or um, a little bit um, that have a, a narrower criteria, I guess. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any others? just add quick, um, we had our uh, Office of Planning and Analysis do a study uh, looking at um, unemployment claims, um, rent burden, poverty, wealth, those, you know, those types of general statistics with an eye towards um, focusing in on households of color and the vulnerability that they have. And our planners estimated we had over um, 2,600 households at risk of homelessness. And just under 2,000 of them were estimated as households of color. So just in, again, um, you know, trying to focus on the, those most vulnerable and those um, disparately impacted, just looking at our data in that way has been helpful to try to focus in on um, what the total need is, but then also where we need to focus a lot of our energy. And I, I would just add to that, in the work that we've been doing, we are, um, I'm the landlord coordinator, so I have a lot of conversations with landlords daily. And what I'm hearing from landlords is, and, and what's, uh, what I don't hear addressed a lot is, yes, we are, we're gonna have this eviction moratorium and it's gonna be bad, but there's also a whole nother, um, there's a lot of things influencing that, a lot of things on the sidelines too, like non-lease renewals. There's, I, I can imagine there's going to be a whole bunch more non-lease renewals that never make it to eviction court. And that is, um, people, landlords are already not uh, renewing leases. So they're on a month to month lease. We know the end result of that. And the landlords have told me, you know, that with the vacancy rates, they're going to be very selective. If they're mm -hmm. putting out tenants who haven't uh, paid rent, they're going to make sure and do their due diligence to make sure that they're not taking people in that are going to have the same issues. And so we're also seeing a lot of movement in from the cities as a civil unrest and safety concerns continue there. They're in, you know, our very low vacancy rate is um, with affordable housing, especially is being consumed by them as well as the incredible vulnerabilities of households that are suffering right now and that are going to do, you know, we've heard from many landlords that um, households with uh, mental health or substance use disorders or physically disabled elderly, they're not getting services during this time. So they're becoming, and I don't want to say a burden, but they are to their neighbors. And these are things that are going to lead to non-lease renewals and evictions and things like that. So it's not only going to be a problem with um, race, ethnicity, gender, large households, but it's going to be our most vulnerable population. And it's kind of sad too when you when you know all this information, then there's just not enough resources out there. It seems like a lot of money, but we we don't have the time. So one of the things that we we are doing too is focusing on our landlords and actually have a pilot program focusing on one specific property or a row of properties along a certain street where we will um, have on-site services, on-site social services to connect people that are struggling with mental health and, and other issues. I mean, we went into this community and it, the, the needs there were greater than in our shelter. And so we, we really need to address that too as a prevention resource and get, people stable that way too.
Mike, if I could interject, I just want to say yeah. that one of the issues that is still being debated at the legislature regarding the off ramp uh, uh, pertains to these non renewals. And so the any information that you all have that could be helpful to um, legislators, um, feel free to send an email to me um, or and I can um, um, it's it's um, Michael D at homelinemn.org. And I can, it's Michael D at homelinemn.org. I think that we could um, really help provide some good information to legislators about this as, a, this as decisions are being made. Perfect. And I'm, I'm just wondering, as far as scale of need, um, Isaac, Diane, um, or Michael, are, are there things that are happening within um, state agencies or at Homeline where you're working to identify the scale of need? Um, that might be helpful for regions to know. Yes, uh, currently we've identified the scale of need at about 100,000 statewide. Um, in comparing that proportion to what uh, Rebecca noted for Dakota County, it's probably far less. Um, if we took the Dakota number, it would be three times that amount. So I think just trying to figure out exactly what the scale might be will be a really important piece that we focus on as well. Um, but currently we're using that 100,000 number. And do you know how that was arrived at or determined? I don't, but I can try to figure that out for you and share it. Okay, great. Okay, hearing none other, we'll continue to move on. I'm actually going to, I want to ask uh, if Mike Fra is still on. We have actually taken thousands of calls um, mm -hmm. from, from tenants that are in the situation. And I'm wondering if Mike has anything to offer here. Yeah, he, sure. Um, this is actually, for all of us, it's impossible to estimate what's going to happen. There's no precedence. Um, somebody put in the chat box that they think non-lease renewals will be huge. It's honestly something we haven't, talked about much, but I believe that there, uh, I've been doing this since 96. There's never been a time that we've seen so many leases that are month to month as they are right now. A lot of landlords didn't renew one year leases last summer, much less this summer. And they stayed month to month with tenants because the relationship had changed uh, and tenants couldn't be evicted. So uh, I think that we've got this very uncommon status of tenants not having one-year leases or long-term leases. And that's kind of getting maybe even closer to the default throughout the state than it used to be. It used to be the one-year lease was sort of the standard approach that landlords would take, but because of the uncertainty of everything, people have just gone on month to month after the one year expired. So it's, it's one of those things that we're trying to, uh, with our tenant hotline, certainly, we're trying to batten down the hatches and figure out how to weather the storm when the eviction moratorium hits because it's just going to be wave after wave of people asking lots of questions. Uh, the big hope is that this giant um, you know, train full of money coming from the federal government will help solve as many of these problems as possible. And, and it will solve a lot of them, but not, not all of them. But the scale is really hard to gauge. Thank you. Um, okay, why don't we move on? Uh, I think we can kind of combine these next two, and I feel like this is the heart of what most of you talked about, but it, it's kind of like, what are you doing right now to minimize um, the, uh, the size of need that will come with the end of the moratorium? Uh, so what are you doing to prepare right now? And the question right after this is, what are you, what are you gonna do? What, are you, what strategies are you identifying to address the needs that will be there uh, after uh, the end of the moratorium. So um, I know a lot of what you talked about were things to, to really minimize how um, uh, and really help households now so they won't be uh, evicted uh, when, when, the, when, it, when it does come, moratorium comes to an end. Um, but, Anything that you, any of you would add of, of what you're doing now and what you um, uh, are, are looking to do once the moratorium is done? Um, I, I guess, oh, oh, go ahead. 
I'll just uh, add one thing that we uh, we are doing right now. We have a um, program that is a uh, combination we're with other jurisdictions who actually got uh, their own funding as well from the area program. So it's Hennepin County, um, Dakota County, Ramsey County, and the cities of um, St. Paul and Minneapolis. And we are on June 1st, we'll have a landlord program similar to uh, ERA. It'll actually use ERA funding, but it will be for landlords to apply on behalf of the, their tenants. The landlord will put the bulk of the information and in, all of the um, documentation and the tenant then only has to upload um, their um, income and then sign. And the, and it'll have a paper application. We're doing a lot of outreach that Rebecca can talk about um, to communities of color and those uh, that need extra help with applications and things like that. But that's that's one thing that we're doing. Again, the program can pay three months in advance. So we're hoping that'll get people um, quick money um, and it'll run side by side with the state program. And I, I would just add to, um, you know, we're just trying to, you know, of course, with the Rent Help MN program, get as many people caught up as possible, just like we tried to do with CHAP, but also realizing that, that that's not going to prevent everyone's homelessness. And then just talking to our um, our FHPAP advisory committee and, and, um, and the agency as a whole, too, just to prepare for the fact that it's gonna take additional resources to stabilize housing for people who do end up getting evicted. What we're seeing right now is that a la landlords are so frustrated. They're frustrated that people haven't been paying their rent, that they're having trouble paying their mortgages because people aren't paying their rent. And so when we've tried to place people into new units, landlords are a lot more hesitant about who they're willing to accept because there is a shortage of available housing for sure. But then also because they're kind of, um, you know, they've experienced uh, uh, something that none of us have ever experienced before with the eviction moratorium and that they, they know what it's like now to ha get really far behind. And so they're doing things like requiring double or triple deposits before letting people move in, which is a huge barrier for people and an increased cost to our program. Um, and then another thing that we're gonna be trying to do to reach out to people even better um, is, is launching this summer is we're having a mobile outreach office to try to get to different events, but then also to some of our most rural areas to bring services to people and try to be able to help them get uh, caught up um, with or connected to different programs, including that one and others. Awesome. I can share too that, um, you know, kind of similar to what Angela was saying, we're trying to do some additional um, outreach and marketing through Rent Help MN, which is kind of cool. So we can do like ads on um, Facebook or like on our local bus. And those are some kind of cool things we haven't been able to do before since there is such. Um, you know, a substantial amount of funding there. So we really want to try to reach everyone that we possibly can reach. Um, and we're just trying to like put our foot on the accelerator to get as much funds out the door as soon as we can. Um, we got some, we were lucky enough to get some funds from um, CDBG funds through the city of Moorhead. So we have a couple of years to spend and our approach is really, let's just try to get it out as quickly as we can. Um, and then the last thing I, have been you know we've been trying to work on is just trying to support our staff because it has been a wild year and um you know our our staff have been working overtime and i know a lot of the other people on this call are in the same situation and really just trying to um do a lot of things with a lot of different changing policies so trying to really invest in our staff as much as we can to like allow them to take some time off and things like that so that we can support them to for you know this next wave that we'll be seeing and I, I mean, I'm hearing that from from all of you. I think that staffing concern. There is so much um, uh, resource out there with Rent Help MN and 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 things like that. But how do you how do you have the staff to do that? Um, I that's where I I've, I've heard questions about of FHPAP, uh, for example, Diane, with being able to exceed the normal services amount um, is is that an option folks could do um, 
or uh, um, you know, is 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 uh, COVID um, ES ESG uh, prevention dollars is is that something or ESP prevention dollars is that something that could be used to kind of ramp up uh, some of those uh, services dollars? Um, I don't know if either of you have have thoughts on that, but or if or if others have creative ideas on how you are getting um, more services funding that you need. This is Diane, and I, I do think um, that that is a possibility with FHPAP. We, we've been open to that even in the past, prior to the pandemic, to be able to um, exceed the 50% service cap, especially if there's other direct assistance funds available. I think it will be a delicate balance because um, for many folks, if they're accessing that rent help MN program, and now we're getting closer to that 15 month time frame. So if, if they do have rent, you know, that's um, past due from March 13th going forward, uh, they're going to hit that 15 month time frame pretty quickly. And then they're going to need some additional assistance potentially to get through the summer or when the eviction moratorium ends. Um, so I, I just think trying to figure out that balance is going to be really important. And, and I just want to reiterate that um, what the home line staff talked about, that legislative solution to maintain oh. for folks, that's just going to be really key. Mike, I just wanted to, um, I don't know if people can hear me. I've had some audio problems, but uh, I wanted to just mention with ESG, uh, we did not have a huge response to our RFP in which we, you know, allowed prevention and rapid rehousing uh, for COVID dollars. We had much, much more for shelter. I think a lot of that was due to the eviction moratorium and the sort of uncertainty about housing and how much providers would be able to do, how much need there would be. Um, so, you know, we with the funds that we do have out there, I do want to encourage people to talk to us if you want to do something different with your funding to try to be creative. Um, we're often more flexible than people assume. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're, if, you know, I, I sometimes cringe at the word braiding funding because, you know, ultimately it has to be unbraided at the end for auditing purposes. And so you really do need to still be able to track where those dollars go and who's eligible. But I also don't want to discourage people from considering, for example, using ESG dollars for staffing and uh, some other source that has much more direct assistance. Um, if you do that, just be cognizant of the fact that you're going to be taking the most restrictive criteria uh, and, and that has to be applied to all persons assisted with that funding, even the staffing. So you just want to be cognizant of that and make sure you're not um, being overly restrictive in an effort to sort of combine funding. And sometimes that happens, um, but we can talk more about that if people have specific questions with their grants. Uh, the real unfortunate thing with ESG is uh, they consider people not to be necessarily at risk if there's an eviction moratorium in place um, until it's 21 days from, um, you know, till they receive a notice that they'll be uh, terminated within 21 days. So we've talked with our grantees about that, but it is um, going to make it difficult with the, with the without knowing when that moratorium is going to end. Great. Thank you. Um, I know we're short on time. Um, can we talk just a little bit about um, equity? Uh, I, we heard a little bit from Dakota County about that, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up from there. But um, anything folks are doing, um, to kind of, actually we also heard um, uh, from Angela about uh, connections with uh, the Lower Sioux community as well and such, but what, anything else that folks are doing to, to make sure that our response is, is equitable and really helping to address disparities? From an F FHPAP specific standpoint, um, in Scott Carver, we included a, um, question on step three of the MPAT related to whether or not households feel that they belong to a community that has historically uh, experienced unfair treatment in the provision of benefits. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's been super helpful in terms of being able to um, more intentionally deliver some of those FHPAP services to people that are disparately impacted by housing instability. 
um, our communities are uh, really benefited by having a kind of community partner organization that, uh, for lack of a better term, really seeks to be a gap filler. And one of the strategies that they have taken on recently is partnering with food shelves across our two respective communities to make sure that there's support in place on the days of food shelves uh, to be able to offer support to people that are going to uh, get food to also apply for Rent Help MN or CHAP or whatever iteration of rental assistance program was out there. They have also sought to do a very similar approach to folks that are living in hotels. And so knowing that this ERA can really support people that have already established residents um, in hotels access support for their rental expenses, I think that's been a really helpful strategy for our communities. And then lastly, I would be remiss to not acknowledge that in Scott County, uh, we are fortunate to have the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux community uh, right within our county. And, uh, you know, they deliver a lot of uh, governmental and social services to their band members. Uh, they do have a family and children's services department that sits in our FHPAP advisory and is engaged in a number of other meeting spaces that we have. Uh, so just ensuring that any information related to uh, any of these assistance mechanisms can also reach them, I think is helpful for ensuring that our band members are, are able to remain housed. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting um, notes that we are behind. So I, I'm gonna have to um, end panel discussion at this point. Um, we didn't have a lot of questions along the way and, and, and yet the, the contributions I felt were very robust. So our time for Q and A at this point is 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 not there, um, but I want to also just say that I think this is a first step or a step along the way. As many of you have said, you you got started on this planning locally, um, uh, you know, a year ago, and so here's another step along the way on what we can do on a statewide level. Um, Mesh, um, I'm sure Diane uh, with with FHBAP or Isaac. Uh, would would love to continue this conversation if that would be helpful and and would welcome your um, comments on that. I'm also going to post um, a, a Google Drive that I've started. Um, Emma shared some marketing uh, information uh, from from uh, Lakes and Prairies. But if folks have resources um, that that you're using in your community, please feel free to use it, uh, add it to this Google site so that people can see what you're doing. And kind of replicate it as needed um, in 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 uh, communities across the state. Um, and uh, so, Michael and Mike, I apologize, I was not a good time manager. Um, but um, I really want to thank uh, everybody who's on on the panel um, for your time, uh, your preparation for this, and for sharing what you're doing. Um, we compete for dollars, and so sometimes that sharing of information feels uh, counterintuitive, uh, but we're all on the same team of, of working to prevent non-homelessness across the state. And, and the work you do to share that is, is really helping us all to do that. So thank you for being available for that. Uh, thanks, Mike. And I just, I, Mike Fra might have some things to say to close this out, but I just want to uh, point out that um, I have questions that could last us for the next two days from today's uh, conversation. Um, uh, this also, secondly, this is re being recorded and will be posted on Homeline's website so that if you have, if you want to go through, you think there's someone who should listen to this, um, to please um, uh, go ahead and let them know. Um, and uh, and so uh, I'm going to let Mike Fra sort of close this out, or is it Mike? Or is it Eric who gets to close this out this time? I'm not sure Eric is still with us right now. So uh, I'll say thank you for allowing us to host this and hope that that was a good uh, resource for us all to connect through. Uh, we will be, of course, doing another webinar tomorrow, Homeline will be, uh, where we will be talking about the uh, eviction moratoria at much more detail, much more in depth uh, from the legal analysis and taking um, probably dozens of questions over a 90 minute session. That's kind of what this, this one was designed for. But again, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I think we're going to sign off. Thank you.